of Jude. And uh, so I'm going to start with Jude chapter 1, verse 1. Jude chapter 1, verse 1. Should be easy since that's the only chapter in the book. While you're getting, oh, by the way, Jude is right before the book of Revelation, the little teensy weensy book, one of them, right before the book of Revelation. Um, just a little background on Jude. The writer of Jude is one of Jesus' four half-brothers. Scripture mentions that he had four half-brothers and unknown, unknown of half-sisters, but at least two because they're uh, mentioned in the plural. And so Jude was one of them. This is not the apostle Jude or Judas. Technically, there were two apostles, Jude. Uh, so just to kind of break it down, among the 12 original apostles, uh, there was James and John who were in the two of the three of the inner circle of the apostles, Peter, James, and John. James and John, were uh, they were both the sons of Zebedee. Uh, there was another James that was uh, in one of the apostles. Uh, he's sometimes referred to as James the Lesser, sometimes referred to as James the son of Alphaeus. Uh, James, that James also had a brother that was one of the 12 original apostles, and his name was Jude or Judas. So there were two Judases. There was that Judas, the brother of James, the son of Alphaeus, and then there was the more famous Judas, the one that betrayed Jesus Christ, Judas Iscariot. Uh, so two different Judases among the original 12 uh, apostles, um, and, uh, but this is neither one of them that wrote this. Of course, Judas Iscariot. After he betrayed Jesus, overcome with guilt, he ended up uh, committing suicide. Um, the other apostle, uh, Judas, uh, went about, just like all the other apostles did, traveling throughout various countries, preaching, establishing churches, uh, and uh, expanding the kingdom of God. This Jude is different. This Jude is the brother of Jesus. As I mentioned earlier, he had four half-brothers. Two of those half-brothers, James, and, and we say half-brothers because they had Mary as their mother, but they didn't. their father was Joseph, the earthly man, while Jesus, uh, the father, was uh, the Spirit of God. The Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary, and that's, what, uh, that's who the father of Jesus was, the eternal Spirit of God. So uh, as far as the father of Jesus, the man. So um, his half-brothers, the two of them, James and Judas, or Jude, as he's often referred to, both wrote Scripture. James wrote the book of James. Now, the one that wrote the book of James was not the apostle James, who was killed in Acts chapter 12, and it was not the other apostle James, James the lesser or James the son of Alphaeus. It was James the Lord's brother who wrote the epistle of James. The one that wrote the book of Jude is also uh, the brother of James. So uh, just a little focus there on that, on who wrote this. Now, Jude along with the other brothers of Jesus, were not believers in Jesus Christ, in his deity during his ministry. They did not believe him. Uh, they thought he was perhaps crazy. At times they were sent to uh, try to get him to tone things down or whatever. Uh, it was not successful. Jesus would turn and tell uh, his disciples, say, who are my mother and my brethren? Is it not these who do the will of God, doing the will of God? Very very important. Uh, so Jude was not a believer, uh, did not believe that Jesus was God, did not believe that he was the Word made flesh, or as Paul described it, God manifest in the flesh. He didn't believe that he was the Almighty, which was and is and is to come. He thought he was actually a little bit crazy until Jesus was crucified, and more specifically, when he rose from the dead. When he rose from the dead is when Jesus' brothers began to believe. And in that short period of time from his resurrection uh, till 40 days later or uh, that they, uh, uh, or 50 days later that, uh, well, 40 days later that they went into Jerusalem, uh, they became believers so much so that Acts 1.14 describes Jesus' brothers as being among the 120 that were in the upper room on the day of Pentecost because it mentions all the 12 apostles uh, or the 11 that were remaining uh, that went up into an upper room, and these all continued in prayer with uh, uh, Mary, uh, his mother, and with his brethren, where, with the uh, and with the other uh, uh, disciples. So, um, 
And by that point, Jude had become a believer. And then, of course, he was one of the 120 that received the Holy Ghost in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. And, of course, we know uh, from Scripture there was another 3,000 later that day after Peter got through preaching the inaugural message of the church uh, that uh, there were others, 3,000 other uh, believers that were added that were filled with the Holy Ghost and that were baptized. All right. Um, this book of Jude closely paralyzed, uh, uh, parallels, not paralyzes, but parallels uh, the, um, the book of 2 Peter. So we did a study on the book of 2 Peter a little while ago uh, in a verse by verse. We'll find a lot of similar themes and statements in the book of Jude. The book of Jude actually was written after Peter wrote his second epistle, and he quotes from Peter, uh, specifically 2 Peter 3.3. 3. We'll get to that uh, later on. So this epistle was written while Christianity as a whole, uh, which at that point there was only one version of Christianity, and it was that Christianity that was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. It was uh, what the apostles taught. It was what the apostles practiced. There were, had not yet been enough time for, uh, although right from the beginning there were attacks to degrade or compromise Christianity, um, uh, as a whole, the Christian church uh, was still under the direct leadership and influence of the apostles. They had not strayed into other traditions, uh, married pr practices with worldly things, become uh, very carnal. Well, some of them were carnal, but uh, they were held account, like when Paul writes to the, uh, the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians. Um, but uh, uh, so it was a, during this time, uh, the whole of Christianity was persecuted by a number of uh, people in authority. They were persecuted by Roman rulers, uh, some on the local level and some all the way at the top. They had been through Caligula's reign. They'd been through Nero's reign or, or were going through Nero's reign at the time. So it was a time of great um, uh, upheaval. It wasn't the hip thing to do to be a Christian because it might automatically get you a death sentence. Um, it wasn't just the Roman authorities that were persecuting the church. The Jewish authorities in the Sanhedrin Council and those and the various rulers of the synagogue uh, throughout various cities uh, throughout the known world at that time, uh, they were also persecuting the church and doing what they could to, uh, whether it was to kill, to destroy, to terrorize, uh, to threaten, uh, to subvert, to turn people away. They did everything they could to turn people away from Christianity. But God was with the church. As the Bible describes numerous times throughout the book of Acts, uh, his, uh, uh, the grace of the Lord was upon them greatly. Uh, uh, God bore them witness. God confirmed the word with signs following. God bore them witness with signs and wonders and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. And, and God worked wonderfully, and so the church be, uh, continued to grow in spite of all the persecution. There was also, Christianity was... Uh, from the beginning and even then being infiltrated by false teachers. Now, for those of you that were in our verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of 2 Peter and 1 Peter for that matter, but more particularly 2 Peter, uh, you'll remember this, and some of you may know it outside of that, but um, there was during this time there's a great warning that the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul also did it in his final letters, uh, and, uh, and then here Jude does it, uh, a warning against false teachers. Um, Peter, Paul, actually the, the Apostle John warns against false teachers uh, in the book of Revelation when he is writing to the seven churches initially and then later on when he begins to talk about prophecy and things to come. And he talks in uh, basically about two different churches. There is the true church that follows the doctrine and the practice and the faith of the apostles. And then there is what he calls the harlot church, uh, the harlot, the whore, Babylon. Uh, there are various names he uses for it in the book of Revelation. But these are, this is that group that perverted the doctrines of Christianity and, what, and the word that God, the gospel that God gave uh, to them. So um, the false teachers uh, that Jude references are often Gnostic in nature. Uh, which is why Jude calls for the church to fight for the truth. Truth only needs a soldier. Truth needs somebody to proclaim it. Once truth is spoken, it has a way of undoing all types of lies. 
You can believe a lie for years. You can be indoctrinated with a lie. You can be uh, uh, taught uh, one thing. You can be brainwashed. You can be uh, put through colleges. You can be whatever it is, and you can have something fed into you. But when there is a word of truth spoken, truth is so powerful that sometimes once it is spoken, all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah. I didn't recognize that. It just has that kind of effect. So truth basically needs a soldier. And what Jude encourages us in his epistle is to be that soldier, in a sense, uh, to contend for the faith, to fight for it, to fight for the truth. Like Peter, when he talks about false prophets, he's focusing on their corruptive character uh, because false prophets do not have a pure character. They do not have a pure heart because you cannot have a pure heart and uh, have a heart that is moving against God. Something is wrong. That's why repentance is always in order. Whether we are a new convert, whether we've been living for God for 40 years, it's always right to engage in repentance. It's always right to engage in a surrendering of our will towards God because we are in a fight where we are contending for the faith. Um when Paul wrote to the Galatian church, Galatians 6, 9, he said, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Why this consistent um, uh, warning, uh, causing to be alert, to be aware of false teachers, people that will come up with a doctrine that might sound kind of right but is not right. It's kind of there, you know, maybe part right, but like somebody said, almost right is still wrong. Right? So almost heaven is still hell. Well, uh, the, the thing is that it, it, these, these false teachers, Jude in this epistle, other uh, apostles in other letters, but Jude in this epistle is warning against them and pointing out the corruptive character. An evil tree cannot produce good fruit. And so when they have an evil heart, well, and, and the Bible describes a heart of unbelief as being evil in the book of Hebrews. So if they have a heart that is set towards God, it is not right. It is not good. It comes from the sinful nature. It may be under the influence of a demonic spirit, but it is definitely the result of that fallen nature. And that has to be repented of. And Jude calls out not only their, uh, not, uh, just their doctrine, but specifically their character. The character of false teachers and false prophets is such that they reproduce themselves and they corrupt everything. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You put a little yeast in the dough, and for those that are familiar with cooking, it will affect the entire dough. Uh, and, and so that is the principle that is being brought out here. Jesus warned against the, um, uh, in, in Matthew chapter 16, he warned against the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, he said um, uh, to beware of it. And at first they didn't understand what he was talking about, but eventually they got to understand that he's talking to them when he's talking about being aware of the leaven of bread. He wasn't talking about bread in the natural world like we covered before. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man. It's what comes out of the man, out of the mouth that defiles a man. Because uh, out of the mouth, from the abundance of the heart, that's what speaks. And, and the heart of man is what is evil and needs to be regenerated, needs to be changed. So, but the apostles and his disciples eventually understood when Jesus warned them about the unleavened uh, bread and being aware or being wary of the leaven of bread, that he's telling them to beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees, their teachings. Um, the Pharisees were those that were that became more legalistic in their approach, interpretation of Scripture, and in their legalism, they made loopholes for their sinful nature. And Jesus rebuked them on this on numerous occasions. The Sadducees were on the other end where they didn't believe. They were basically, uh, I don't know if you could even call them a hopeful agnostic, uh, but they, they did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe the word, the Bible is the word of God. They did not believe in the power and the miracles and so forth. They were the Sadducees. And Jesus said, beware of that because that will uh, harm you. That will curse you. That will uh, 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 condemn you eternally. That, there is a leaven there that you don't need to get a hold of, a leaven that undermines faith. Rebuke that. Turn away from it. Amen. So B Jesus warned against the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 
the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian church. And um, he uh, he's talking to them. They had had somebody that was engaged in sexual promiscuity, and and they were like, oh, we're, they were glorying about it, you know, because they thought we're so tolerant and and uh, we're letting them come in, and they're still a part of the fellowship and all of this. Uh, the love of God must be wonderful. And Paul is saying, you are out of order. And so he rebukes them. He tells them to get things back in order. And then he says, your glorying is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? So he says, purge out the old leaven so that you can be a new lump because you are called to be unleavened even as Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. He says, we want to keep the feast not with the old leaven, not with the leaven uh, or nor with the leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. There needs to be a transparency. There needs to be an openness. There needs to be a purity. And there needs to be a walking in truth. And a walking in truth is not just walking correct doctrinally, but is it, it is our lifestyle that must reflect the glory of God. Amen. So he said, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to keep company with fornicators. And he said, I'm not talking about the fornicators of this world. He said, but you don't need to uh, hang out with the fornicators or the covetous or the extortioners or the idolaters. Uh, if they're in the church, if they call themselves a brother and they're going to still live in this fornicating or covetous or idolatrous or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner and they continue in those things, he says don't keep company with them, don't hang out with them. Why? Because they need to know they're not a part of the body. They need to know that those actions will prohibit them from entering the kingdom of God. So he writes to the, uh, um, to the Corinthian church on that matter. And he refers to the leaven of malice and wickedness. The fact that Jude, uh, and then here's another question then that often comes up, um, use more so about the book of Jude than any of the other epistles, because as we go through here, we're going to find where Jude quotes from other sources. And so that becomes justification for some to try to find these other sources so that they can hold them up also to be the word of God. Now, here's the thing. Um, just because Jude quotes from non-biblical sources, from other books that are not in the Bible, does not mean that those sources are divinely inspired, that they have the authority of the Word of God any more than numerous other times the Bible will quote somebody and it makes all their words to be inspired. So, for example, and I'll run through a couple of these uh, very quickly. In the book of Acts, Paul is preaching. Uh, to a bunch of Gentiles on Mars Hill where they had every kind of false god there. And eventually he found a, a uh, one altar that said to the unknown God. So he begins to preach to them from there. And while he's preaching, he quotes them and he says, certain also of your own poets have said, we are also his offspring. So he's quoting poets, he's quoting writers who are not believers, don't even know of Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. But that doesn't mean that what they wrote was inspired of God and, and we need to search out their other writings so that we can believe and obey them. He's using a truth maybe that they had said and bringing out that thing. In that instant, in those words, they said what was true. And the reality is it doesn't matter who speaks the truth. It still remains the truth, right? So you've got uh, Islam who says that uh, there is one God. It is the truth. It doesn't matter who says it. If somebody else comes along and says there is one God, well, that's what the Scripture teaches. There is one God. So it is the truth. So um, anybody that says things that are true, um, it doesn't mean that everything else that they say is also true. Jesus, on numerous occasions, when he would cast devils out of people, he would forbid them to speak because they knew who he was, because they were going to proclaim who he was. Well, in proclaiming who he was, they were going to try to gain credibility so that they can bring all their other lies in there because Satan is a liar. He's the father of it. When he speaks the truth, the purpose of his speaking the truth is not so you can believe the truth and walk in the truth and obey the truth, but it's so that he can then company it with it, his lies. 
He did that from the beginning, and so he quotes what God says, but a little bit different in Genesis 3. The very first time we get a word from what Satan says, did God really say you can't eat of every tree in the, uh, in the garden except, uh, 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 or you can't eat of it unless you, or you'll die? And, and, of course, we see the perversion of what he said compared to what God actually did say, and we see his shifting of the focus uh, from what God has available to us to look at all what you can do, there's, that there should be any kind of temperance or any kind of um, uh, holding back or, or checking of our desires or things that we may want. Uh, and that's a lie that he still uh, promotes today. So this is, this is the world. Um, anyway, that's where I was going. Jesus, when he rebuked those devils, he commanded them not to say who he was because they would have used any truth they spoke to then company it with a lie. So just because you quote from somebody doesn't mean we want to seek out all their writings because the rest of it might be inspired of God. No, we have the inspired word of God. It's right here. This is it. Uh, we don't need to come up with New Testaments uh, other than what's in here. We don't need to come up with other writings or whatever. There are many other writings that can be helpful uh, that, that, uh, uh, th th as long as they are in line with the Word of God. But if they're not in line with the Word of God, we reject them. Amen. All right. Um, the Apostle Paul, when he writes to Titus, he quotes um, some of their prophets. Or uh, Let's see. This is Titus chapter 1, verse 12. He says he's writing to Titus. And he said, and he's talking about the Cretans, and he says, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, he's not talking about a prophet of God, he's talking about one of the Cretan prophets, uh, one of their religious leaders, he said that their uh, prophet said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies, which are terms to refer to other things, but, um, and then he says, this witness is true. Now, he's not endorsing that one Cretan prophet as being a man of God that, that we need to follow and put our confidence in, and he's an under-shepherd under Jesus Christ. That's not what he's saying at all. He's, talk, he's just saying that this particular witness, this particular statement is true. Um, and then um, even Jesus himself on numerous occasions would quote uh, others in Mark chapter 7, um, verse 10 and 11. He, he quotes Moses. Now, that was a prophet of God. And we do have his writings. Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whosoever curses father or mother, let him die the death. And then he quotes the Pharisees and Sadducees, the scribes, those that had come to him. And he says, but you say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corbin, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. Uh, now, he quotes them. But he turns right around and he rebukes them for their teaching that they're teaching, which is undermining the word of God, uh, which the intent of the, of the word of God was to bring honor to uh, fathers and mothers. Um, John chapter 9, I'll just make this the last one uh, on this topic. But John chapter 9, verse 41, Jesus tells some of his detractors, he said, he said unto them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. No sin would be counted against you. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. So he's quoting them, uh, but he's telling them basically something he interprets elsewhere where he says, by your words you're going to be justified, and by your words you're going to be condemned. So you be careful with what you speak, and you speak in humility, not in the arrogance that some of Jesus' detractors spoke. And they say, oh, we see, we know, we know. You know? All right, since you say you know, you're going to be held accountable for actually knowing. Um, all right. So there's other references in scriptures to other uh, writings, um, but the basic rule of thumb is whenever they, uh, if the scripture quotes them, then they are right in that thing, if, they, if the scripture affirms what they quote. Uh, obviously, if the scri scripture counters what they quote, they were not true. And, and ultimately, it is this. When anyone speaks the truth, it remains the truth. Just because somebody didn't uh, uh, speaks the truth that might be bad, does not undo the power of the truth itself. But the rest of what they say does not necessarily become true. All right, so now let's start, finally, with the book of Jude. Uh, Jude chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified 
by God the Father and preserved in Christ Jesus and called. All right. Jude, servant of Jesus Christ. Um, Jude introduces himself as a servant. Um, he didn't try to pull rank or try to name drop, uh, being that, oh, by the way, I, I'm just not a follower, but I, I'm a half-brother of Jesus Christ. He, he, he doesn't do that. Now, we might be tempted to do something like that, but he doesn't do that. He sees himself, he's not even exalting himself, even though he is, you know, a brother in Christ as a joint heir with Christ. He does, that's not how he's introducing himself. He's introducing himself as a servant to Jesus Christ. Servant. Um, Seem, and uh, he introduces himself as a servant of Jesus Christ even before uh, saying that he's the brother of James. Uh, by that point, there was only one James um, left alive, which was the James that was his brother who had been, uh, and I think still was at that point, uh, bishop in uh, Jerusalem. Um, but by putting himself as a servant of Jesus Christ first, it seems like he prioritizes that relationship as being greater than being the brother to James. And that just... Uh, ought to point out to us, our chief identity ought to be as a child of God. Our chief identity ought to be as a follower of Jesus Christ, not anything else, whether that has to do um, with uh, our status, the money that we make, our career, our connections, our family, uh, our race, our nationality, our hobbies, uh, or any other rank or, or position or title we may hold, our chief identity ought to be that I am a child of the King, that I am a servant of Jesus Christ, that I'm a part of the body of Jesus Christ, I'm a part of the called out ones, the church. It's our greatest identity. And any other identity that conflicts with this identity must need to be rejected. Amen. Every identity that conflicts with the identity of being a disciple of Jesus Christ is a part is a, an identity that we need to discard if it conflicts with it. Now, sometimes you can be both. You can be an American citizen and a follower of Jesus Christ, but you're a follower of Jesus Christ first, right? So, whatever other identities we have, we have numerous things that in our lives that become a part of our identity, but nothing ought to trump the identity of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our greatest identity. Um, he says that this is to the sanctified, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. So to the sanctified, those who are sanctified. This was not, this epistle is not written to sinners. It's written to those who are sanctified. The word sanctified um, has the, the meaning in, in the Greek uh, of those who have been made holy. How are we made holy? We're made holy by the work of God in our lives because we cannot make ourselves holy because we started out with a sinful nature. So we can never be pure and we can never be overcoming and overpowering sin. We, do, we don't have that. We are already succumbed to sin. And the wages of sin is always death. And the soul that sinneth, it shall die. It's just the nature of things. And, and uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is, is death. It, this is what is. So we can't make ourselves holy to be different from the world. So how does that happen? That, that happens by the power of the Spirit of God. That's why the Spirit of God very often, especially in the New Testament, is referred to as the Holy Spirit. Why? It's an emphasis on the type of work and influence that the Spirit of God has in our lives when it works. When the Holy Ghost is working in somebody's life, when God's Spirit is working in somebody's life, it will make them distinct from this world. It will change them. It will change their mindset. It will change their worldview. It will change their beliefs. It will change their opinions, uh, their lifestyle, their, their finances, their, their words, their behaviors. It changes everything about it. We sang about it earlier. When your kingdom come, everything changes. Well, the first thing that changes when the kingdom of God comes is the souls that surround Render themselves to God. Amen. So we're made holy by the Holy Ghost or sometimes of the Holy Spirit, but sometimes in the Scripture in the Greek, the way it's, it's actually phrased is the spirit of holiness. 
Ha is the way it comes out. And then when they translate it, they sometimes they'll translate it like in Romans 1 as the spirit of holiness. Sometimes they'll translate it as uh, the Holy Spirit. All right. Um, so those who have been made holy, in other words, the spirit, we've been filled with the spirit of God, and the spirit of God is at work in our lives. And then he says preserved in Jesus Christ. Uh, preserved means uh, basically guarded, uh, reserved, and to be kept from loss or injury. Um, so we're not only been made holy, we're not only made sanctified, we can be kept. The old timers use this phrase a lot. And when I mean old timers, I mean the parents, the ones that my parents would refer to as the old timers. Uh, but, the, you know, I've been kept by God. Well, what is it? You don't have to succumb to the world. You don't have to succumb to the world system, to the world's values, to the world's influence. In fact, we are instructed by the Word of God, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So we can be kept from things or, or protected or reserved from this world. And, and then it says, and also called, which uh, the word called there, the kletois in the Greek, um, refers to those who have been invited and those that are selected. So that's who this scripture is written to, this book, to them who are sanctified by God. So it's not written to sinners. Now, if it's written to sinners, then there would be an emphasis on how to be saved. Right? Because that is the sinner's number one need, how to be saved how to find salvation or to receive salvation. But this book is not given to us to teach us how to get salvation. It's written to people who are already saved. I mean, I know there's a measure of it that will, our salvation is finalized, you know, when we get to heaven or when Jesus returns. But, but we, it is to those that the work of salvation has already started. That's who this is. Of those who are already sanctified, the Holy Ghost has already been poured out on them. Um, it's not written to sinners. But then again, this is also true for almost all the, um, uh, all the epistles. They're not written to sinners. They're not written to teach us what you need to do to be saved. To find that, of course, we have to go to the book of Acts. That's how the scripture is, de is designed so that it always points to the same beginning. Uh, the epistles were always written to the saints which are scattered abroad, to the church which is at Corinth, to the, uh, the, the, the church of God, which is in Galatia or whatever, and all these uh, different areas. But it's always written to the church or to the called out ones or to the ecclesia, the, the, the different terms the scripture uses. But it's always the believers of the body of Christ. So it is here in the book of Jude. It's not written to sinners. It's very clear. Who I'm writing to? To them who are sanctified. In verse 2, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. So mercy, this is the um, Elias, uh, it's the outward manifestation of piety uh, or pity, uh, of compassion. It is, and it refers to a practical application of mercy. It's not just theoretical, it's the real thing. Something happens as a result of the mercy. So mercy is what God does, what God shows uh, to us. Peace is the result of that experience to us. So in fact, we talked about it uh, not this Sunday, the Sunday before, where we talked about the shalom of God, the peace of God. It, it, it refers to more than just a tranquility, more than just a quietness. It is a wholesomeness that is there, a wholeness of being. Um, and, uh, and so this is what he's saying. Mercy unto you and peace and love uh, be multiplied. Love, of course, the, the agape be multiplied. He wants it to greatly increase and abound. He just wants it to, to explode abundantly. Uh, in our lives. Verse 3, beloved. Beloved, agapatos in the Greek. Um, this is just, it's basically a term to remind us that we are the products of agape. The reason why we're here is because of the love of God, the agape of God. Uh, so he says, you're the products of, of agape. He says, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which it was once delivered unto the saints. Now, remember what I said earlier. The way the New Testament is designed is that when it comes to salvation, it will always point to when it was once delivered unto the saints, when it first came. And if you want to find out about salvation, 
You cannot do so uh, uh, adequately or fully without getting into the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the whatever we want to call it. It's, it's the thing that guides it all. Everything lines up to it when it comes to how we receive salvation. Um, so, beloved, when I gave all diligence, or when I made diligence, when I did the work of doing diligence, um, to write unto you of the common salvation. Now, here's the thing. Not, salvation not being common in the sense that it's like, ah, oh, yeah, it's just a common thing. Not like that, but common meaning that we all have the same salvation. There's not one salvation that Rachel has and a different salvation that Chris has and a different one that Joel has. No, it, it's all, our salvation is all the same. You get it the same way. There is no other salvation because God said beside me there is no Savior. There is not any other. The only Savior you're going to find is in God, and that was through Jesus Christ. All, he is the Savior of the world. The Bible is very specific, very clear on that, right? So this is the common salvation. And when he says common, he says that which is available to everyone. It's not exclusive. It's not like, well, I'll give it to you, but not to you. I'll give it to Dante, but not to Pastor. No, it, it's a common salvation. It was that which was once delivered, and it went to everybody. So Jesus said, whosoever will. It was an open-ended invitation. Let, uh, whosoever thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Talking about receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Because uh, if you believe on him, as the scripture has said, you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, as John stated and interpreted that very uh, statement by Jesus Christ. Um, so the common salvation, that which is available to everyone, he says, it was needful for me to write unto you. In other words, it was necessary uh, to write unto you and to exhort you. Now, to exhort what he is saying, uh, the word of Pater Cologne, um, it refers to calling to one side. So in other words, Jude is not just telling us this is what you need to do, you know, like do as I say but not as I do. He is saying I'm, I'm exhorting you, and the word that he uses is you need to come join me in doing what I am doing, to come with me and join me along in this endeavor, in this mission. Uh, so Jude was already doing it. He's saying, and he's, cha he's challenging you to, uh, to join him in this. I uh, exhort you to call to one side to earnestly contend for the faith. Now, to earnestly contend, the, uh, these words actually comes from a single Greek word, but it referred, has the idea of combating, uh, of somebody that's going in for a fight. It comes from the wrestling world, which in their day, uh, the wrestling world, the winner um, triumphed, uh, the loser lost his life. So it was... Uh, uh, you went in there, I mean, you weren't just going to, you know, uh, play around a little bit for the entertainment of the crowd. <laughs> you were going to make sure that you got to survive by making sure that your opponent did not. And, um, and so the, when they entered that wrestling world, the, the term that he uses here to earnestly contend, it is one that inc has the idea of uh, agonizing effort, giving everything I have for it. And the fact that it is found in um, uh, uh, the present infinitive case uh, suggests that the action is a continual one, one that we need to continually do. It's not just one time I studied it out and I came to this conclusion and that's it on a particular teaching or topic or whatever. Um, that is good. But contending for the faith is continual. It's something we will do till the day we die. Uh, one of my favorite quotes comes from a man, Sir Edmund Burke. You've heard me say it before, but the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is that good men do nothing. In a sense, what he was saying is that it is the obligation of good men everywhere, and women, uh, but of good people everywhere to do what is right, to fight for what is good, for what is true, for what is honest, uh, uh, for what is pure. It is our obligation, and if we do not fight for what is right, then darkness will prevail. The only thing necessary to cause darkness to fail is for the light to shine. But if we hide that light under a bushel, that's not how God intended it to be. Amen. So it's to agonize, to earnestly contend for the faith, not just a single time. 
We guard or protect things or guard or protect people that we deem valuable. And so whether we use a secret service or whether we use bodyguards or whether we use cameras and other types of, of firewalls or, or whatever, we protect things that we deem valuable. And what Jude is saying here is that we need to earnestly contend for the faith. Now, we, this is valuable. This is not something that's like, yeah, yeah, you know what? Well, we can start that quarterback. We can start the other quarterback. Ah, uh, uh, you know what? You've got that guy in fantasy football. You know, I'll take this other guy. Yeah, you know, it's not that kind of thing. The faith is something that is ultimately valuable that we need to contend for the, in an agonizing effort to give everything we have to protect it, to further it, to champion the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Um, Proverbs 23, 23, the, uh, Solomon wrote, he said, buy the truth and sell it not. Buy the truth, or in other words, invest in the truth. Uh, get it. When the, You guys remember not long ago, about a year ago, there was a toilet paper shortage because of a pandemic spreading throughout the world, and people began to panic and uh, became frantic and thinking they were going to run out of toilet paper, and so they stocked up. Uh, and um, even though they were only saying two weeks to bend the curve, they must have known something because they, they must have known it was going to last quite a while. There were people that were just stocking up like crazy. And so as a result, some people couldn't get toilet paper, or you're like, for weeks, you'd go that, no, nope, still none, you know. You're like, whew, getting a little low, and, and uh, uh, maybe you had to borrow some from somebody. But nonetheless, it, but it, toilet paper became a, a high commodity, right? You know, and so, and if you're going along, might have had a few rolls left at home or whatever and go along, and you said, oh, they've got some. It was no question. Boom. You said, I, I generally got it at Costco. Grab a, uh, a big old uh, package of them. Yeah, we're taking them. We're not letting this opportunity go by, right? That's what you got to do with the faith, the faith of Jesus Christ. You're buying it. When you've got the opportunity, it's like, oh, the stock is now temporarily available. If you want in on this stock, you better get it now. Boom. You're investing right away. The, you're going to invest in a particular peculiar, uh, 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 maybe uh, highly prized real estate market, and, and nothing's been for sale, but all of a sudden there's one lot that comes open for sale. Oh, if you can at, like, get it, uh, you'll do whatever you can. You, you bankroll this, you, you mortgage your house, you, you do whatever. You've got to get that property, right? That's the attitude. Buy the truth. Uh, whenever you find it, camp in it, invest in it, get it, bury it in your heart, right? Buy the truth. And then he said, sell it not. Now, to invest in it, first of all, how you do that? When you see it, when you hear it, the truth. One, you believe it. But as we've learned from Scripture, there's no such thing as a mental belief that is separate from obedience. Which is why the Apostle Paul and various other writers of Scripture use the term believe and obey interchangeably. They'll quote a scripture that says belief, and they'll quote it as if it said obey, and vice versa. And, and why? Because you cannot believe without obeying, and you will not obey without believing. It, it, they go together in the scripture. And for those that understand the Hebrew mindset, you understand there is no such thing as a mental belief if there's not a corresponding action of obedience that follows it or demonstrates it. So, um, he says earnestly uh, uh, or invest in it, you've got to believe it. Believe the truth. You got to obey the truth. You got to do the truth. This is another scriptural term to do the truth in the New Testament. You got to walk in truth. Another scriptural term found in the New Testament. Uh, I'm, I'm so I'm so glad that uh, my children walk in truth. And and then you got to love the truth. Where the Apostle Paul wrote that uh, those that did not love the truth uh, that they would open themselves up to uh, believing a lie and being forever damned. Uh, um, in, uh, in eternity. So we have to love the truth. And when we find truth, uh, and, and faith is the same way because they, they go together. To true faith, a faith that saves, has got to be rooted in truth. If it's not rooted in truth, it will not provide salvation. So you got to love the truth, but you got to love the faith. you got to obey the faith, live the faith, do the faith. You, everything about it's earnestly contending for the faith. And he says, and don't sell it. Buy the truth and sell it not. He said, don't sell it. Don't compromise it. Don't give it give it out. Oh, you know what? Well, I think this will be enough for me. Here, you can have a little bit of that. 
give away. Well, I'll, I'll sell out a little bit of this. I'll compromise a little bit here. I'll, I'll mix in a little paganism there. I'll, 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 I'll surrender this. You know what? It is true, but you know what? I think I can get by maybe with some Christian liberty in that sense, and hopefully God forgives me and, or whatever. And all these little things. No, no. If it is true, that's top priority. Top priority. And the faith that is tied to that is all out. It's not I'm going to be a 90% Christian, I'm going to have 90% faith. It's all out. Now, I know we are human, and we fail. And it is that, and it just happens. He remembers our frame, and God's mercy towards us is from everlasting to everlasting. But that's not for us to say, well, we don't have to contend for the faith. Jude's response, or Jude's contention here, the very thing he pops off with after greeting the people, pronouncing a blessing on them of mercy and peace and love, uh, he says, look, when I decided to write unto you, uh, uh, the, the, I, uh, uh, the first thing I wanted you to know is that you join me in earnestly contending for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Amen. The apostles did that. The early church did that. Acts 2.42, the Bible says they continued uh, daily in the temple and from house to fa- house to house, um, they they uh, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Everything that was tied to the faith, they didn't let it go. So whether it had to do with the teaching or the fellowship, the interaction with the church, uh, or in breaking of bread. Uh, uh, doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers, uh, they were they were all in on the faith. Romans 6 and verse 15, and I'll wrap this part up here uh, shortly. God be thanked, he said, you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. So doctrine is not just something to be head accepted. Doctrine is intended to be believed. He said, you were a slave of sin. But what changed was you obeyed the doctrine. You obeyed the truth. You obeyed the faith. Amen. In one interview uh, with a lady named Sheila, uh, they were talking to her about her faith. And uh, she said, I believe in God. She said, I'm not a religious fanatic. Uh, I can't remember the last time I went to church. Uh, She said, but my faith has carried me a long way. It's called Sheilaism because her name was Sheila. Just my own little voice. Well, you know what? When it, when we do what is right in our own eyes, we are bound to fall into a ditch because we cannot see outside of the leadership of the Holy Ghost, um, outside of repentance, which means it's not about my own little voice or my own faith or my own ideas. It's about, Lord, like Saul of Tarsus said, what wilt thou have me to do? What do you want me to do? Um, so uh, earnestly contend for the faith. The faith is not just something, ah, yeah, no, I don't know. It's, it's, we can't have that type of attitude. That type of attitude causes a, an individual believer, a Christian, a church, an organization, a denomination, to eventually get to where they sell out a little truth here or there, and they get to no longer believing the resurrection of Jesus Christ, no longer believing that Jesus is the Savior of the world, no longer believing that the Bible is the Word of God, no longer believing that God has the power and not just the power but will uh, deliver from sin and deliver and heal and save and, 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 and do phenomenal w- what is necessary to accomplish His work and to help save your soul. And, and so salvation just becomes a matter of, you know, well, if you do good or whatever. But you can never do good enough. To, sa- to save your soul. Your soul's already contaminated. So if you spread contamination, it doesn't mean you have less. It just means you gave it to somebody else. Right? All right. Well, let's wrap that part up. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. I pray, God, that you would help us to love the truth, to love the faith, to buy it, not to sell it, not to give it away, not to neglect it, so that it falls by the wayside. God, help us to sell it not, to guard it, to let it be reserved in our hearts forever, to earnestly contend for the faith, because it's too valuable to let a single drop go to waste. I pray, God, let your will be done in our lives. And yes, Jesus, let your kingdom come. 
in Jesus' name. Amen.